Thank you, Tim. That was uh, what a marvellous testimony and what a marvellous testimony. Um, I have to say that um, Tim is a rare beast, obviously not just for that reason. Um, that is quite a rare thing to do, isn't it, for, um, for a church leader to take that kind of interest and, and go and visit lots and lots of people where they are. But so you know, there are, he's not the only one in England who does this, or indeed Wales or Scotland uh, or Ireland. Um, and the ones who we find are most helpful to congregations, and um, they tell us that the single thing that has helped them most in enabling them to help their congregation is what Tim did, which is to go and visit people where they are. It doesn't actually matter whether that's a care home or a tennis club, or their yacht in the Mediterranean, should you be so lucky. <laughs> uh, it's not about just the business people, though that was, that was, that, those were his people, so that's who you visit. Uh, so if you want to be canny and to enable your church leaders to get a vision for the place that you spend time, one of the things to do is to invite them. And for some of you, that will, you know, they might have to get on a train. He got on a train from Loudwater to, to London. That's actually quite a significant, at one level, that's quite a significant thing to do. It's quite a long time to do. Uh, but it makes a huge difference. And as I say, it doesn't really matter what it is. You could be volunteering into a charity shop. Come and have a look. This is what we do. This is how it is. Come and look at the back. Look at the mess it is. Look how many piles of clothes we've got. You know, look how much we have to throw away. Actually, we get stuff we have to throw away. You have to pay for it. And that, and you, you find things out, don't you, when you visit people. So I just encourage you, um, the Butlin way. Um, just a few little bits of um, housekeeping from me, if that's all right. Um, first of all, to remind you that that book, The Life of Grace, is free, apart from the postage. Um, so if you want more, go on the website, Hope, Hope website, and uh, you know, order thousands. Uh, we really want to uh, use that book to bless people and probably up to Christmas is the last moment, really, in that sense. And there will be celebrations of the Queen's life, I think, around the anniversary of her death. Um, uh, these, uh, the, I, I didn't fulfill all righteousness the other day with these red little things. Uh, you see the dots. You are one of these. A glorious little jewel. If only I had rubies to give you. Um, uh, I'm sure your worth is greater than rubies, whether you're male or female. But um, the, the point is, it's just a little reminder. For some people, these sort of tactile things help you. Put it in your pocket, throw it in your purse, stick it in, 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 in the well, in the, you know, the, the cup well in your car, whatever it is. Who are you? I, just a reminder um, of who you are, that you are one of God's people uh, out there in the world, uh, surrounded by those who don't know you, don't know him rather. Um, there are some more of those that your job, God's work, or if you like your work, God's work. Um, do take those. I'm sure you know some people uh, who might uh, benefit from that. And finally, there was the little card. Um, if you'd like to fill one of those out and pop it on the table and sort of just connect and get some of the free emails and stuff like that, it's all free. So it may help you day by day. Um, Thank you, everyone. And I particularly want to thank uh, all the people who helped me organise this, uh, get me organised. I'm not the most organised human in the world, uh, but uh, the CMJ team are. <laughs> so praise the Lord for that. And I have to say, I don't think they're there, but I have to say the tech team were just brilliant. So absolutely brilliant. Well, this morning, I'm um, going to do a couple of things. We've been exploring the Hebrew worldview uh, as opposed to the Greek worldview. If you like, um, if you like um, life is a peach, not an orange. Uh, if you've been wondering what that might mean, um, life is not, in the Christian world, like an orange. That is, lots of little segments which are separated out. Life is a peach. It's all one thing. Life's a peach. And if you want to get cheesy, and why not, uh, at the centre of a peach is a rock. And that's on what we rely, but we are sensitive on the outside and strong on the inside. It could go on, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but so uh, we've been thinking about how we can be uh, every day fruitful with Jesus, every day fruitful with Yeshua, every place with Yeshua, every task with Yeshua, and just a couple of comments on that. Isabel um, was uh, at the time 60 year old a woman, she was in Gateshead, and one of our guys, a guy called Neil Hudson, who, who wrote the book Imagine Church, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book, is sitting there with a small group in, in the evening, and the vicar happens to come along, 
And they're talking about where are your front lines? You know, where, where do you feel like God has called you to make a difference for him? And they're going around the room and pretty much everyone says, yeah, I can see something. And the room's getting quite excited. And then Isabel says, well, um, I don't really think I've got one. And there's that slightly awkward moment when there's one person in a group who's not quite with the programme, if you know what I mean. Uh, you know, oh dear, this is a bit embarrassing and we've got a visitor and all that kind of stuff. And so Neil, who's brilliant, says, so well, Isabel, tell us about your life. And she says, well, you know, I, I love the church. I do quite a few bits in the church. Fantastic. I really enjoy it. Look after the family. And I love my grandchildren. And uh, actually, one of my grandkids comes, comes around for lunch, you know, uh, three or four times a month. And we have lunch together. And, you know, she always asks me about the sermon. Interesting. So I tell her about it. And uh, it's lovely, you know. And, that's, he says. and then Neil brilliantly asks this question. How old is your grandchild? And she said... Uh, she's 23. And suddenly the room goes, oh my goodness, you've got a weekly opportunity to talk to a 23-year-old. Those are gold dust. These are the people we most want to reach in the world. You are having a purposeful conversation about the Bible three or four times a month with a 23-year-old. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Suddenly, every, we, we've got to pray for you. How, why haven't we been praying for you? Etc. And the vicar goes, oh my goodness. I'm not just preaching to Isabel. I've now got to think about what I say at 11 o'clock, between 11 and 11.30. How's that going to help her at 1 o'clock? And of course, that's true every Sunday, isn't it? Because actually, what is going to help us help other people out there not every sermon is meant to do that, but you know what I'm saying? Overall, something completely changed in that group. The preaching changed in the church. The group started praying for one another in those contexts. And because we were working with this church for three years, Neil comes back three months later, and he says to Isabel, how are you getting on? And Isabel says, ooh, my daughter's coming to church now. So there's the granddaughter. She's, my daughter's come to church. I'm really on a roll. We'll see what happens wherever you are. And the point was, Neil said, so what was going on there? Why? I didn't think my family counted. Even that. See, that's how deep it can be, the sacro-secular divide. So no matter where you are, I didn't think my family counted. Well, of course. So Jesus says, as you go, as she went, she was making disciples. He had appointed her for fruitfulness and she couldn't, if you like, see it. And in a way, we've been talking about uh, every, every day fruitful with Yeshua during this time. And I, I want to say that one of the things we've been doing is talking about, in a sense, what he's inviting into, is into abundant life. But we, in a sense, I haven't talked much about him. Praise the Lord that we have a worship band that does that, in a sense, that Provide, has provided that platform for us. It's been so Jesus-centred. But who is this Jesus who calls us and sends us and so on? I'm, I'm going to do some other thing, but I just want to begin here. And uh, you quoted from the book of Hebrews, and, um, you know, as you know in the book of Hebrews, chapter by chapter, the writer builds, if you like, this list of titles, this list of attributes of who Jesus is um, over... 12, 13 chapters, but like the sort of master of ceremonies at a boxing match, you know, those people go introducing, you know, Muhammad Ali, 57 fights, 56 wins, 55 by knockout, the holder of the WBA, WBA and WBC belts, the undisputed champion of the world, John Brooks, you know, that sort of idea. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. He's been getting at me from the beginning, did you notice, you know? If he knows he's been getting at me from the beginning, I should never put that picture up. He said, he said yesterday, you know, we've got some really interesting things this evening. <laughs> and then he said, well, you should have had Aaron Ina this year because we would have had more bookings. That was really nice of you as well. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, just, I'm not sensitive. I'm not sensitive. <laughs> anyway, the undisputed champion of the world. And through the book of Hebrews, the same thing builds. Jesus, the appointed heir of all things, the radiance of the Father's glory, the exact representation of his being, Son of God, fully human, high priest ascended into heaven, the true locus of worship and sacrifice, greater than the temple, 
Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, seated at the right hand of the Father. This Jesus is with us day by day. This Jesus sends us. He is the one who says, go and I will be with you always. Every day with this Yeshua, every place with this Yeshua, every task with this Yeshua. And yet this Yeshua is also the one who grills fish on the beach for a weary set of workers. So with that in mind, uh, this morning I want to do two things in the time that we have. Three and the third one I'm not going to tell you about yet. But the first one is this. I'd like to give you a few thoughts on this. One is that one of the reasons, if you like, and this is a slightly controversial thing to say, but I think it's true. One of the reasons why uh, overall the church for the last uh, sort of 1,700 years or so has not seen this is because of the way we read the Bible. It's not just that we have a, a, a limited gospel in the sense of a whole life gospel. Where does that come from? It's we, we've read the Bible in that way. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have it. If we were reading the Bible as a whole life document, we wouldn't have this problem. But we haven't been reading the Bible that way. We've been reading it through a sacred, secular, divided lens. And I'm just going to give you a couple of thoughts, I hope, that will help you. I'm not saying probably many of you do this already, but I'm just you know, that perhaps might help you read the Bible more as a whole life text. And then I'm going to do something very radical on a Sunday. I'm going to preach a sermon. <laughs> who knew? I mean, John Brooks said we were going to do new things this year, but, you know, I mean, who knew this was going to happen? Um, well, I'm going to give it a go anyway. And we're going to look at Acts 27 um, together when that comes. Now, of course, the Bible is a whole life document. God's concern is for all of life. And we see this, the word is described, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for what? Every good work. Notice those different tones. There's teaching, that's one tone. There's rebuke, stop it. And there's correction, which is a bit more gentle. And there's training in righteousness. Those are different modes, aren't they? The Word of God operates differently in our lives at different moments. But it's all that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work, whatever those are. So how can we ensure that that's actually what the Bible does? That's its goal, to bring glory to Jesus, the Father and the Spirit, and to enable us to live well with him. Well, here's a verse from a Psalm of David, and this was one of the um, verses that really sort of triggered me in terms of this journey. Here it is, um, Psalm 144, this is verse 1, of David. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. I'm going to give you one minute, 90 seconds, just to talk to somebody to your left or your right. Uh, what strikes you about that verse? There's no catches. I'm just asking you to think about it with, with one another for 90 seconds. What strikes you about that verse? Let me, let me stop you there for a second. Don't have a lot of time for this one, but what I'd like you to do, if you're willing, just, just shout out a word or a thought. I'll repeat it. Just a word or what, something that struck you. This is not a paragraph, just a word or a thought. Standing on Jesus on the rock. Standing on Jesus on the rock, the rock, yes, thank you. 
Life is a battle. He makes him skillful at killing people. Skillful at killing people. <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers. He's the one who trains us. Put on the armor of God. He trains my hands. Sorry? We need to be teachable. We need to be teachable. Yeah, that's a... Very practical at the back. We trust in the Lord for victory, but that doesn't exclude the training. We trust in the Lord for victory, but that does not exclude the training. <laughs> yeah, let's let's log these things. I've got a great sermon next week. <laughs> <laughs> training through the battles of life. Training through the battles of life. Thank you. I was saying fishing as well. Fishing. Vision. Vision. Thank you. Catch her a fish, okay, yes, that's... Yeah. In the spiritual battle, the war is strategic and the fingers are the details. Yeah. 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 Ah, very good. In the spiritual battle, the war is strategic and the fingers are the detail, the tactics. And we see that in David's life. I'm, I'm not going to do that sermon, that, that one bit of it, but that's very important. <laughs> There's a big picture, and then sometimes God says, uh, wait till you hear the, the sound of the wind in the balsam trees, and that's when you attack. It's the detail. Go down there. Yes, one more. David was already good at it. The smallest members need to be involved. The smallest members need to be involved. Yes, fingers. Very good point. Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Sorry? We're co-partners. We're co-partners. Well, we could go. Yeah, one more. It was his everyday job. Bingo. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry? Three mice. Three It's personal. That's... Hey, you know, this preaching game is easy when you get everyone else to do it, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that great? Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? I mean, there's loads of things I haven't seen in that. I'm quite serious. This is going to be a much better sermon. <laughs> now, for me, what happened with me, the first thing was I suddenly realised that... So thank you for all of that. Let's hold on to all of those things if you were able to hold on to all those things um, in the time. But let, let me just tell you what happened to me and why I, I chose this. What I suddenly realised is that David is not some singer-songwriter. He's not basically a worship leader. I've read these things for years as if he was a worship leader, as if he's Graham Kendrick or Tim Hughes or somebody like that. You know, with a rainbow guitar strap, he's a soldier, he's a captain. He's not just pouring out his emotions to the Lord. He's, he's this soldier, he's a captain, he's a rebel chief, he's a king. And what I realised, what you said, what I realised, suddenly God trained him to be effective as a soldier a dispenser of death in the service of God to protect God's people. It's obvious. But I had missed it. And I realised it was very easy to generalise uh, too quickly and preach David's psalms as if they were written, you know, by a contemporary singer-songwriter struggling with these inner demons and anxiety and relational breakdown rather than written by a soldier actually facing Philistine armies, the threat of execution, assassination and civil war. How could I have missed it? And therefore the rich range of application that comes from it uh, directly to our armed forces and to people working in the defence industry right now. I have a friend who makes missiles uh, at MBDA Stevenage. And of course, indirectly to anyone in the workplace, as was said, it's his day job. Now, the reality is that David wrote 73 psalms, and 81% of them include the word enemies or foe. 81%, 57 out of the 73. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us quite a lot. Don't? Who are these enemies? Well, Indeed, the evil one may be working through people, but the presenting enemies are Philistine forces, Amalekites, Saul, who David never calls an enemy, but actually is an opposing force, Absalom, his son, and his own people. Why has David got all these end people trying to kill him? Because of his day job. He has a very toxic workplace. <laughs> the thing is that at root, the context... The person writing these things, the experiences that they are coming out of, are coming out of his experience at work. His experience of caring for somebody at home. His experience of standing on a trade platform telling everybody it's going to be late. His experience of selling a company. His experience of being a commander of a boat. Whatever it might be. That's what it's coming out of. 
That's what these psalms are. They are his personal testimonies. He's crying out to God of, here I am in this situation. Here's what you've done. Here's what you might do. Why are you taking so long? Oh, whoa. Uh, Etc. We could all write psalms like this. Actually. Maybe not as well. <laughs> but <coughs> they are testimonies at root. There are, some of his psalms are, if you like, more like a standard hymn in the sense of God is great. You know, uh, Psalm 19, heavens declare and so on. So David's psalms are written in day to, day-to-day life and they are in contrast in a sense to most of, not all, but to the majority of the other psalms, psalms which are, if you like, written by the professional worship leaders who on the whole, the sons of Korah and Asaph and so on, are talking in, in a sense in more general terms. And you need both. You need both. How could I have missed it? Well, I missed it because I was affected by the sacred secular divide, but because all the commentaries I had, re- had read and the way that I'd been taught had made me think of it almost instantly in spiritualized terms. And so I'd missed what God was saying. If you were at Lucy's uh, evening yesterday, her, her poems are, are, in a sense, lots of them are like that. Here's what's going on. Well, it was wonderful. Uh, I did quite a lot of research on this, and although, again, I, I'm, at the time I was quite interested in, in, in everyday life, home life, and um, work, and just to give you the example on work, I discovered at the time, this wouldn't be the case now, that 50% of evangelical Christians had never heard a sermon on work, which uh, was quite a, th- quite a thing, really, when you think about it. And then I thought about it a bit more, and I realised that it was even more extraordinary, because, uh, and, and again, I don't want you to hear that this is only about what you, uh, we all do daily work, but it's not, this, this whole thing is not just about that, because it's all over the Bible. In the beginning, God created, and Genesis 2 clarifies it's primary, not secondary. He takes the man and puts him in the garden. In Genesis 3, describe, the Bible describes the consequences of sin and rebellion on work. In Genesis 4, it's the story of Cain and Abel. One brings um, brings the fruit of their work, and it's acceptable. One brings the, the fruit of their work, and it's not acceptable. Uh, the theme of work is in the first big construction project, big boat. Um, a project, if you like, carried out in direct obedience to God's commands and then there is the theme of the second big construction project which is big tower which is conducted in direct defiance of God's things of commands and it's in Joseph obviously it's in Moses and Jethro the first management consultant advising Moses on how to restructure the judiciary it's in Leviticus and Deuteronomy instructions it's in exploration of leadership in Deborah the one major judge who is not criticized and the other judges it's in Joshua and Kings it's obviously in Ruth and it's in the Psalms as you've seen where David often reflects on the challenges of his work and you'll find it in Proverbs which ends with that great portrait of the wife of noble character, the woman of Chile, where the focus is very much on how the wise woman works. The zenith of Old Testament lived out wisdom is what? A housewife. A rich housewife, but a housewife. A woman who displays such a formidable range of domestic, managerial and leadership skills uh, that you could only... commercial skills that you could only probably match her by genetically splicing together Nigella Lawson's, um, I don't know, (laughs) Karen Brady and Angela Merkel. And if you did splice those three women together, this is what you would get. (laughs) So be very careful what you wish for. No, it goes on, doesn't it? And you find work in, in, in Ecclesiastes and in the Prophets and in Esther, obviously, uh, what does it take to make a stand in a risky context in Daniel and Nehemiah and, you know, and in the Gospels, in Colossians and Philippians and unto the end? So it is extraordinary that it has not been preached. That's the point. It's extraordinary that it's not been preached because it's not like you're looking for in vitro fertilization. You're not looking for some contemporary modern issue that, that the Bible does not address directly as a topic. It's all over the Bible. So we're not actually asking anybody to preach what's not there. We're asking them to preach what is there. 
Um, so it's not seen. It's not obvious. And uh, what, we, you know, what the psychologists call this is selective perception. You know, we've all had that, haven't we, selective perception. We inevitably can't log everything. Uh, there are people probably here who have logged all the different types of trees on this, on this place. I mean, I'm just looking, they look green and lovely, you know. And there are people who walk through and hear the birds and can tell there's 17 different types of birds in the, you know, in the trees. And there are people like that, there are probably some of you. There's at least one person here who knows 200 Latin names for, uh, for shrubs. <laughs> there you are. Uh, <laughs> um, and so on. You know, you, you see things because you see them and they're important to you. So selective perception also relates to selective enthusiasm and then selective application. So, um, and, and all preachers, to some extent, tend to land in similar places. I had one preacher who was a very good preacher, but every sermon was about evangelism. Absolutely every sermon, no matter what it was, somehow it ended up about evangelism. <laughs> Fine, but there is something else to preach here. And some people are very therapeutic. It's all about your relationship with Jesus. Another thing is, you know, they are very teacherly. They will tell you all the context and make sure you understand everything about it. And there's a role for all of those. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a bias, if you like. And that's one of the reasons why we need more voices than one usually to help us. Because we're all somewhat limited. God has put particular things in all of us that we need to hear. I mean, if you, and we have recorded that first three minutes of your responses to the David thing. There was a lot of different insights there, weren't there? Things that were striking you. And things that I hadn't heard before. Not that I'm the judge of that. So the Bible is full of material about a whole life topic set in everyday contexts, applicable to everyday contexts. So one of the things I think we kind of almost have to discipline ourselves for a while until it becomes automatic is to ask ourselves the question, what does this text say to me about, yes, my relationship with God, my relationship with others? Of course those things are, are central, but my daily activities, my leisure time and my rest, my engagement with God's people. And one of the ways to do that, really, is it's a, it's a very simple discipline, but it's easily lost, is to recognise that both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, biblical narrative, um, there's ne not nearly as much detail as you would get in uh, English literature or in, indeed any European literature, really, or, or in a newspaper. So what do we know? They, uh, Abraham is told by God that he's got to sacrifice his son and he spends three days on the journey. What do we know about Abraham on that journey? Absolutely nothing. There's no coverage. We're just meant to go, oh, we're meant to enter into an imaginative journey with him. But when there is detail, then we have to pay attention. Why is it there? Because it's usually there for a reason. And within that, you know, if you take, say, Pride and Prejudice, we know lot what uh, Mr. Darcy looks like, and unfortunately, it's not like Colin Firth. <laughs> uh, we know what the house looks like and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And so one of the disciplines that we apply, and we will apply it to any text, really, is the discipline that journalists use. We just ask ourselves, who's in this scene? Who's actually there? You know, you ask, who's there? Who are they? You ask, what actually happened? Who, what, when? When is it happening? Where is it happening? Phil was talking about the importance of place. Where do these events occur? What's the location? Why is it happening? And we've heard Boaz mentioned a few times. But, you know, what happens in chapter 2 is what? Boaz, we're told, is a kinsman redeemer. And the danger of that is that instantly we fast forward to Jesus as the kinsman redeemer. And we need to get there because, you know, that's really, really important. But if you go there too quickly, and that's the whole content, you miss the notion that where is Boaz? He's in a field. What's he doing? He's farming. Who's el who else is there? Well, who else is there? There's him and the supervisor. Oh, it's a workplace with a hierarchy. Oh, we're in a workplace. And then you go, what's going on? We, we, we miss why he speaks to Ruth so tenderly. Whoops, there we go. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, so tender to her, under whose wings you've come to take refuge, God as mother. And then perhaps we miss, it, we, we miss the detail here. Drink, drink from the water jars, he says, because she doesn't know that she's got permission to do that. She's, she's a new 
intake. She's not even an employee. Can I have a cup of coffee? When the contract cleaner comes to LICC, do they know that they can have a cup of coffee? Well, I have to offer one because he, he, he will not take it. He will not presume. But he's in the kitchen cleaning it and there's a coffee machine. It's quite good. It's not as good as the coffee that is served in any CMJ unit around the world. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> but it's quite good. And then he, he offers a bread and, and wine vinegar at lunchtime and he offers a parched grain. And we'll miss all this tenderness, this inclusion in the community. And we might miss, you know, that I've told the men not to touch you. He's seen the culture. We might miss that he's shaping the culture. There's a sexual harassment opportunity there. And we might miss that and so on and so on. We might miss that he tells her to pull out stalks. He tells the people to pull out some stalks for her. In other words, he changes the way that the harvest is being done. He changes the systems for the sake of the poor. Changes the systems. We don't do harvest that way. We don't leave stalks. Incredibly generous. And a stalk had 30 or 40 grains. That's a lot more easier than picking up these little things off the ground. And so on. The detail matters. The context matters. And actually that then enriches our understanding of what a kinsman redeemer might be. And what a real kinsman might do, might do. That it would not only be that the kinsman redeemer comes to save her soul or to save our souls or to save other people from death, Satan. And it well, eternal separation from God, but actually to bring wholeness now. The now and not yet that's been mentioned already. So, the detail, the basic, in a sense, questions. So let me take you to Acts now, and um, this uh, marvellous passage. I'm going to read uh, some of it. I don't know anybody... Um, Heard a sermon on Acts 27? Anybody? No? Okay. Well, this will be fun then. So, Acts 27, you know the thing. Paul has been arrested. He's appealed to Caesar. He's on his way to Rome. They've stopped off. Julius the centurion has been kind to him and let him visit some friends. And then we're going to get a storm. And I'm going to read uh, some of this. Not all of it, but uh, some of it. So I'm going to start at verse 9. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, yeah, you need some training here. <laughs> uh, so don't we all? Much time had been lost, beginning at verse 9, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But then Centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of, of, of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cowder, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat so. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirius. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. <laughs> Not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. 
Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to... Um, what is it? I've lost it. We're going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they'd eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognise the land, but they saw a bay and a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard and to get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land. Well, this is a rich passage, isn't it? And there are parallels we might explore between Paul and Jonah, two men in boats in a storm, uh, both charged with communicating the gospel to the centre of empire. Parallels, too, between Paul in a storm on the Med and the disciples of Jesus in a storm on the Galilee. And we're meant to, we're meant to think about those parallels. And this passage is, in some ways, also the climax of the book of Acts, uh, a book that begins with God's promise that the disciples would be his, his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And here we see God's sovereign hand ensuring that all the powers of chaos and darkness that the sea symbolised in biblical thought could not prevent the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ getting to Rome, the epicentre of the dominant superpower of the time. God will achieve his purposes. How encouraging for us to know for us, say, just in the UK, where research suggests that at least 94 out of 100 people don't follow Jesus, that God will achieve his purposes. How encouraging for those concerned about the, the salvation of the Jewish people worldwide, that we know that God will achieve his purposes. But this is also a narrative set in a particular place, at a particular time, with particular people. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit has given us a huge amount of detail here about this voyage. None of other, Paul's other voyages have anything like it. It's like, oh, I went here, then I went there, then I got stoned, then I got up, then I went over here, then I got stoned, then I got up. I mean, it's very, very short. This is a whole chapter, enormous amount of detail. What is the Holy Spirit saying to us about this? Well, usually in, in Acts, we see Paul in actually quite short encounters with, with people in the marketplace or speaking on Mars Hill. But imagine for a moment that you are Paul in this situation, in a boat with 273 people who don't know Jesus. Sailors, soldiers, other passengers for months. Just you and Luke and Aristarchus, 1% of the population, 3 out of 273. Here you are, a minority on this front line, as many of you are at work or at school or at uni or perhaps in a retirement home for a prolonged period of time. You've built a good relationship with a centurion and then one day... God gives you a message for the senior management team, the centurion, the pilot, and the owner of the boat. Now, you're a prisoner by status and, a, by trade, a tent maker, but you have some previous experience of being shipwrecked. <laughs> three times. So you speak up, and by doing so, you challenge three types of power. 
the power of the state, centurion, the power of expertise, the senior consultant, and the owner, the power of money, ownership. They ignore your advice, as often happens in many contexts. The wisdom from above is not always acceptable. So what do you do? Now, it's clear that Paul has been given an insight into the future by God. He's been given a prophecy. He is certain the boat is going down. The professionals are not so sure. They think it's worth the risk. The owner thinks it's worth the risk. A boat costs a lot of money, even today. So it comes to Paul where? Not in a, in a non-religious context it comes to, not in a fellowship group or in the church, or, but out in the world. And notice that Paul, Luke doesn't say that Paul uses any particularly religious language to communicate it. At this stage, Julius and the pilot, the soldiers, they obviously know that Paul is a follower of the way. That's why he's there. They know this. But he teaches us that we don't always need to say God says. At some point we need to say that, but we don't always need to say it. Now, interestingly, this... Wisdom from above ultimately comes for the benefit of the whole crew. After all, Paul does not need a boat to get Paul to Rome. He can whistle up a whale from the North Atlantic (laughs) and dump him on an Italian beach at the mouth of the Tiber. He has previous on this. So God is clearly concerned for Paul's companion. God offers information that will limit the commercial impact on the owner. So does God care about the physical and material well-being of an organisation or a family or a church or a home or the people you're with? And it's always been that. Let me tell you a spectacular story because this is a spectacular story. So a friend of mine's father, a guy called Colin Draper, was a production manager in a plastic extrusion moulding factory. You've all been to one. <laughs> and uh, there were no orders. No orders. The workbenches were silent, been silent for a while, and the business was in serious danger of folding. He was a production manager, not the managing director, not right up at the top. So one day, Colin, a man of faith and prayer, goes down into the moulding workshop, takes a chair, sat down by one of the benches, puts his hand on the workbench, and prays that it would get busy. And then he goes to the next bench, there are 12 benches, and does exactly the same thing. And the the men, it was men in that workshop, are standing around watching this. Now, you kind of got to know that God told you to do that, to do that. But even if God told you to do that, it takes quite a lot of courage to do that. He does it for six working days in a row. And on the seventh day, the factory burned down. Just kidding. No, they could have got the insurance, couldn't they? (laughs) On the seventh day, they got 72 orders. What was Colin doing? He was seeking the well-being of that factory, the well-being of a boat, the well-being of wherever it might be, well-being of a, a neighborhood. Paul's job is to speak up for the welfare of others And in a sense, leave the results to God. He doesn't win the day. We don't always win the day. So you set sail and you're with Paul now. So what's the scope of your ministry now you know this boat is going down? I wonder how we prayed um, for our neighbours and our streets and our towns and our organisations and our schools and our hospitals when we saw that the pandemic was going to be something really grim. And it rages, this storm, for days, and they throw the stuff overboard, as you heard. What do you do? Uh, This business is going down. This business is about to go into liquidation. That's my best joke. (laughs) Uh, I think I'll keep away from the sea level jokes, yeah. Anyway, in the midst of this terrible storm, with the boat heaving and the waves crashing and the sun blotted out from the sky and your body being lurched from side to side and your stomach in your cranium, do you have any space in your heart left for anyone else? Tough, isn't it? Pressure often makes people self-focused, but Paul isn't self-focused. 
He prays for everyone's mortal lives, not just their eternal lives. He intercedes, if you like, uh, holistically. He encourages them emotionally by telling them not one of them is going to die. Men, you should have taken my advice. But now I urge you to keep up your courage. Now, I don't think, actually, uh, that he told them, you, you know, I told you so, you should have taken in that tone of voice. Actually, he's saying it because, look, I was right then. You can trust me now. So we speak at one point, we may be ignored, but we gain credibility for the next time we speak, when the Lord comes through, if you like. He witnesses to them clearly by telling them of his extraordinary confidence. Verse 23, last night an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said this. Notice that the angel tells Paul that God had given him the lives of all who sail with you. Him. It's extraordinary. He's obviously been praying for those people, for their physical rescue, as well as, no doubt, for their eternal salvation. He is not like Jonah, not bothering to pray for the sailors in the boat. You know, the captain has to come down and rebuke him. Why aren't you praying to your God? He's praying for everyone. Vicky was a respiratory physiotherapist in the middle of the pandemic. She was assigned to an ICU, overflowing with patients. 12 hours shifts for weeks. She used to work part-time. She's standing there in full PPE, holding a young patient's hand. The oxygen blowers on full blast, very noisy. Some of you, I know, have experienced this. Silently praying that God would heal this young man and that he would save his soul. It's not the first time that she'd done that, and it wouldn't be the last time that she did it. And not everyone got better, and often they didn't know because a patient could be moved to another ward or another part of the hospital, whatever. Anyway, a few weeks later, a friend calls her up and asks her if she treated this particular man. And Vicky, the consummate professional, says, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to disclose that information. And her friend says, well, he got better and he's become a Christian. <laughs> Take Vicky out of the ICU and maybe that young man dies without coming to know Jesus. Take my friend Richard out of his particular business and the, and the admin people don't get the salary rise they deserved. Take you out of where you are and maybe something happens that shouldn't have done or something doesn't happen that might have done. Take the story I told you yesterday, the woman at the school gate. Take her out of the school gate and maybe those relationships don't happen. Like Paul, we do not choose our circumstances, but maybe we can choose whether we consciously, intentionally involve God in our circumstances, where we are. So Paul brings encouragement. And I want to say here, though, that what's interesting about this is that uh, Vicky, somebody came to her after about three months into uh, the pandemic, and they said to her, Vicky, you are a total inspiration to us. And uh, Vicky said... Uh, I, I can't understand why you would say that to me. You know that I've been in tears pretty much every day for months. And the woman said, but yeah, Vicky, but, you know, you're so honest and there's something about you. There's something else there. And I asked her about this and she said, well, you know, I was so tired. I was, it was 12 hours. By the time I got home, I just put some food in had a shower, went to sleep, got up. I had no time for a quiet time. The only thing I did, I sang this song to, me, to myself on the way to work. Not I, but Christ in me. We sang it at the beginning, didn't we? Not I, but Christ in me. Not I, but Christ. That was what got her through. But the Lord was faithful and he was doing something. But to her, she's going, I was just in tears. What kind of witness am I? No. In that brokenness, nevertheless... The Lord shone through her. Nevertheless, he was faithful to his promise. Not I, but Christ in me was happening every day, though she was in tears. We can't minimise the impact of some of these things on ourselves. But we mustn't make ourselves feel guilty when, in a sense, we feel like we should be the perfect, strong Christian who, you know, never feels anything and never gets tired. Jesus got tired. So Paul brings encouragement, he, and then he strengthened them physically. Um, I take some food, eat already. You need it to survive. So we care for people's physical well-being. We know that, don't we? We know, we know to do that, whatever it is. You take a meal to a neighbour, you take a, get a cup of coffee for somebody, whatever it might be. 
And then he does something odd, which might seem odd, at least to us, in our politically correct environment. He prays in public. Remember, this is a, so it's a polytheistic context. He prays in public. He says grace in public. He took some bread, gave thanks in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. Hmm. I wonder what's going on there. A while back, my wife, uh, Katrina, was working in an NIH hospital. Uh, she works in theatre as an anaesthetic nurse. And one Sunday, she got a tr- strong intimation that something bad was going to happen the next day. So we prayed about it, that she would be ready. The following morning, the theatre teams were all called into the staff room, those who weren't actually active at the time, to be informed that a colleague's six-year-old son had fallen out of a first-floor window and died. And the person who delivered the news said something like, and do pray for her. Now that is startling enough to do in an NHS uh, staff room. But then my wife said, because actually in a sense the Lord had prepared her. The Lord had given her a word, not as specific as Paul's, but nevertheless an intimation, something's going to happen. She said, let's do it now. And right there and then she prayed in an NHS staff room with a mixture of Christians and people of other faiths and people of no faiths, She took a stand to say that in this, frankly, unimaginable pain, there is a God who cares and we can share it with him. Nobody came and complained. Now, of course, as you've picked up, there's something important about the words that Luke uses here. These are the same words he uses to describe Jesus breaking bread at the Last Supper and on the Emmaus Road. They're the same words. The same words. What is Paul doing? He is feeding on Christ. And he's sharing Christ. How do we get through we feed on Christ? Now, at one level, most of them would not at that moment have eyes to see. And there are theologians in the room who will debate this, obviously, because it's slightly controversial in a way. What is he doing? He seems to be sharing Christ. He, these are the exact, that's what Luke seems to think he's doing. And finally, Paul protects them practically. When the crew try to leave, he tells them, tells the centurion, they've got to stay, and this time the centurion um, keeps them there. So Paul is under massive pressure, and I know some of you uh, have been in those situations and some of you probably are now. But even under this life-threatening pressure, he doesn't lose sight of the mission he's been called to. I wonder whether we have such a big vision for the impact that we can have. Do our children know that they are prince and princesses in the corridors and classrooms of their schools, sent to carry the fragrance of Christ there? Does the student in the university, the mother at the school gate, the barista in Starbucks, the labourer at the port, the executive in an office, have such a rich, holistic vision of how God can work through them to bring peace? Offering wisdom from above, praying for physical protection, witnessing clearly and taking practical initiatives for the physical, emotional, spiritual welfare of those people around them. Is this the kind of vision we have? And of course we don't go alone. Acts 27 doesn't just give us a picture of the scope of our ministry, it gives us an insight into the faithfulness of the God who sends us. Who is this God who sends us? This is the God who sends with purpose, who granted Paul favour with the centurion, who gives wisdom from above, as James tells us he will, wisdom from above beyond human computation, who communicates whatever the barriers, however dark the day, however terrible the storm, he sends an angel. I mean, God wants to get through to us. (laughs) And who responds in prayer, making clear what he will do in this instance, strengthening his people by word and his presence, keeping his promise, not one person is lost, and fulfilling his purpose. The gospel will be heard in Rome as as God intended. This is our Lord, the God of Paul and Lydia, Mary and Martha, Colin and Vicky, of everyone in this room. And by astounding grace, by astounding grace, the God of everyone in this room, yours and mine, Emmanuel. Amen.
What I'd like to do now, um, if you're willing, I would... Uh, we began this uh, weekend and uh, we've just had a commissioning service and I made the observation that it's quite rare for people to be commissioned to the place where they find themselves during the week. So what I'd like to do, if you're willing, is to lead you in a prayer and I'd like to lead you in this prayer twice. And the reason I'd like to read in this prayer twice is because I'd like you to be standing with another person who will put their hand on your shoulder, if that's okay, or on the top of your head, if you prefer, or not at all, but close, as a symbol of the laying on of hands for whatever context you're in. And then I will pray, and then you will swap over. And if you need a three, you can do that. <laughs> so if you're able, please stand. And please don't feel like you have to do this. Yes. We're all free, are we not? So, um, just before we begin, just whisper, because I, this could take a long time, whisper to the person next to you the place that you're thinking about that you want to be commissioned to, or the people you want to be commissioned to. Just whisper that one-to-one, -one very quickly. Okay, that should, that should be it. All right, decide who's getting prayed for first. The, one on the, the ones on the left, pray for the one... The ones on my left, pray for the ones on your left, okay? Okay, let me do this now. Father God, if I could have a bit of quiet. Thank you, Lord. Father God, King of kings, Lord of lords, thank you so much for your son. Thank you that he has indeed transferred us from dominion of darkness to the kingdom of your beloved son. Thank you that each one of us is a son and daughter of your glorious, majestic fatherhood. Lord, we now ask in Jesus' name for our brother or our sister. We commission them to the place and the people that you've called them to. We pray that, Lord, you would enable them to model your, Christ's, your, your Christly character to the people around them. We pray that they may do the things that get done in that place with grace and in the power of the Spirit and with the wisdom from above. We ask, Lord, that you would so fill them with your grace and love that they are able to minister your grace and love. We pray, Father, that they would bring shalom, that it would mould the culture around them, however small the group, tiny the space, that your light would shine in it. We ask, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and courage to be a mouthpiece for truth and for justice, to speak for the interests of others. And we pray, Lord, too, that you would enable them to share your glorious gospel in its richness, that people might hear the wonderful news that Jesus is Lord and Saviour and Sender and Friend. For our brother, sister, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you can go down the other way this time. That prayer, by the way, is not scripted. So if this one isn't as good, <laughs> don't get jealous. So, Father, once again, Father God, we come before you. We bring our brother, our sister to you before you. King of kings, Lord of lords, hallelujah, that you love them, that you sent your son to die for them, that he has sent his spirit to live in them, a newborn creature, and sent them into these places, Lord. Sent them among these particular people to be your ambassador. And we pray, Lord, we commission them to those, that place and those people. And we ask, Lord, that you would enable them to model the beauty and the splendour of Christ's character to those around them. That you would empower them to do the things that need to be done in those places with your wisdom and in your strength. And we ask, Lord, that you would so lavish your grace and love on them that it spills out so that you enable them to lavish your grace and love on those that they meet with. We pray, Father, that they would be people who bring your light, your shalom, into those spaces, into those relationships, into the way things are done in that place, that it might be ever more or ever increasingly a place of shalom. We ask, Father, that they would indeed be able to speak with courage and grace and respect and honour, truth 
and seek justice for all, looking to the interests of others. And we pray too, Lord, that they would be given both the ability when opportunities come spontaneously to share the great news of Jesus and also the ability to develop relationships of trust and respect and friendship that enables them over time to share the wonderful, glorious news of the one who has changed all of our lives and who we serve and long, long to please. Long for those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We commission them, Lord, now in the name of your Son. Amen. 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 Thank you.